Well, welcome to Central Christian Church. From wherever you are watching, my name is Dean Keast, and I am so thankful that you're here with us today. I'm our Glendale campus pastor. And if you've not met our other campus pastors yet, you're gonna have that opportunity today. And that is uh, something I'm excited for you to experience. Now, I want to ask you as we begin to uh, consider uh, this statement, that the church is intended to be more like T-ball than like Major League Baseball. Now, I know some of you, as soon as I say baseball, you're like, ah, it's boring. I, I don't like sitting around for hours watching a guy, guys on a field with a stick chasing a ball. But if you're like me and you love baseball, you're like, ah, sitting around hours watching guys with a stick chase a ball. I mean, we, we love baseball or you really don't like baseball. But T-ball is an entirely different category. It is controlled chaos. In fact, probably all of us have a T-ball story, if I'm guessing correctly. But T-ball is all of these youngsters running around on a field, having someone who uh, has played the game before them, someone who has uh, some knowledge of the game at least, trying to instill something in them, new skills, new knowledge, trying to capture their attention, which you know is part of the stories that all of us have about T-ball. Everyone is eager to play the game, but eventually it becomes something that we just allow the professionals to do. And I wonder if we've done the same thing with the idea of living out our faith. At the very beginning, it's so exciting, but eventually we just let the professionals do it and we invite our friends to come and watch. Now, Jesus lived in a time where people were preconditioned with this idea that they didn't get to live out the, their faith in uh, their religion. It was something that was just more done through rules. But the, the priests were the ones who did all of the work. But Jesus seemed to come along and it seemed like there's more importance to what happened outside of the building than what was happening inside the temple. And so he gathered around him 12 disciples that he wanted to, uh, to coach along the way. And he chose not the first round draft picks, so to speak. He chose, uh, you know, not the sharpest knives in the drawer. In fact, Luke, in one of his letters, says that people looked at the disciples and they no noticed that they were unschooled and ordinary men. These, there was nothing special about them but they were just eager to follow. They were eager to listen, to, to hear what Jesus had to say, to, to, to see what he was gonna do, to participate with him. And so Jesus coached them. He said, you know what? It's, it's more about loving God and then loving people the same way that God loves you. Well, what does that look like? And so he took them with him and he ate with sinners. And he took them with him and he had conversations with people that he wasn't supposed to have conversations with according to his culture. He touched lepers. And he wanted to help them to understand through stories that he told. And so he would tell stories like this, that loving people is kind of like a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of them was lost, so he left the 99 and went to find the one. Or that loving people is like having lost a coin and not being able to sleep until you find that coin. Or loving people is like having a son who is gone, kind of off the deep end, so to speak. But a but being a father who longs for, prays for, waits for the return of his son, not so that he can heap guilt and shame on him, but so that he can embrace him, throw a party, and forgive him. 
See, this is what Jesus coached his disciples in. And then he said, this is for all people, everyone, all nations. And in the blink of an eye, Jesus leaves the disciples. He ascends into heaven. And he leaves these 12, actually 11 at this time, one had dropped out. But he leaves these 11 with this burden on their shoulder of all people. How do we do that? How do we, how do we communicate that to a community of people who have always allowed the priests to do all the work? So Peter, one of those disciples, writes a letter. And he writes a letter to the church all throughout uh, Asia Minor, even into Europe. And he says to them uh, something that I think translates not just to those people who heard it then, but it translates to our own hearts. And so I want to ask you to internalize this because this letter that he wrote was so cherished that it was kept for ages and ages. In fact, it was put into our scripture. We know it as the book of 1 Peter. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, but you, and he's speaking to all followers of Jesus, you are chosen ones of God. You are chosen for the high calling of priestly work. You are chosen to be a holy people. You are God's instruments to do the work and to speak out for God, to tell others of the night and day difference that he made for you, that he brought you from nothing into something and from rejected to accepted. This is our calling. This is your calling. Your campus pastors want to introduce you to four people from the New Testament, men and women who would have been in the audience. People sitting in the seats of the church, watching as the disciples, the, the professionals led. But they got up out of their chair as if to say, God, I am unschooled. I am ordinary, but use me to bring people closer to God. Or if you were with us last week as Albert Tate spoke, he might say, now, this is a really dumb idea, but maybe God, you could use my life to bring people into a relationship with Jesus. And I'm gonna turn you over to John Moten now as he's gonna tell our first story. I just love what Pastor Dean just shared. Nothing to something rejected to accept it. What a great challenge for us. Now, I wanna talk about our culture. Our culture, our Christian culture is really precarious if you really think about it. Think about the times that we're asked how we're doing and we answer we're doing good, although we're not. Or think about the times when we used to drive to church uh, when we were in the car, we have a very heated argument. And the minute we get out of the car, even though we've been screaming at each other, we respond by saying, we're doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's funny how we answer certain things, right? But one of the most precarious answers that we have in church culture, now I don't want you to feel bad about what I'm gonna say, and I'm not talking about any particular campus. I'm just saying that it's, if you said it, don't feel bad about it. But I love the answer that we often have when we are asked to serve, step up, or step out. You know, if someone asks you and reaches out to you for you to be involved in some kind of capacity, and your answer is this, and, and it makes a lot of sense, the answer is, I'll pray about it. Now, the reason why I find it so precarious, because let's think about, yeah, you should pray about it, but think about this. What if your campus pastor called you and said, hey, uh, they, they called, you answer, I have $12,000, and uh, I really feel that God's laid on my heart to give you this $12,000. No, it's not stolen. I just want to give it to you. Now, be honest. 
How many of y'all would say, I'll pray about it? I bet your answer would be simply this. Absolutely. Now, how come we can't be more like the character I want to talk about in the Bible, Lydia? Lydia was one of those characters in the Bible that was in between the great things that happened in Paul, the great things that happened in the cell, the jail cell, that we could easily miss. And so I want to read to you out of Acts chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to a woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Now, the important thing you could easily miss in this passage, Lydia urged them. She invited them. She persuaded them. She reached out. She, per she persisted that they stay with her. Now, from all accounts, her enthusiasm was very evident. She exhibited something I want to talk about right now, and that is that she had generosity with her hospitality. Generous hospitality is the word I want you to think about, because this is the kind of thing that we need to have as a church, as we think through how we could say, God, I want you to be made known. God, I want you to be experienced. God, I want others to hear about your hope and your promise and what you are. And that's important that it's so much in that that I invite people. I have generosity. Now, these kind of things, it's combined with hospitality, but it's being and having an urge to see God. I want others to know about you. Now, is your response when you want to serve, when you want others to know about the hope that you have in Jesus, is it conditional? Do you have to pray about it or will you be faithful? Now, there are two things I want you to know. Two important things, and I believe all of our campus pastors would say this same thing. Two things that really is the heart of your, uh, of your campus pastor. And the what, first one is this. We want something for you, not from you. We want you to experience God's goodness, his grace, his purpose, his love. We want you to understand and, and discover more about what God is doing. We want you to respond to the things that you hear on any given weekend. And you know what? Speaking of things and responding of any given weekend, you know what the greatest compliment you could give to your pastor or anyone who is speaking? You know what the greatest compliment you could give to them is not good job. The greatest response you could give to them is simply this. I'm going to live that out. That's the greatest compliment. That's the greatest response you could give because that is a response to what Lydia did. Lydia, Lydia heard this message and she responded to it. The second thing I want you to know about is this. Understand there is more to life than me. It's not just a t-shirt, it's a lifestyle. It's experiencing the incredible presence of God in that you want others to know about this as well. You want others to experience the hope that you have. Lydia persuaded. Lydia was persistent. Could you imagine a church that lived out this, that lived in a way so much in that, that they were so faithful, they responded to the message, and they wanted others to know about this hope. Now Pastor Steve's going to share more about what this looks like. Generous hospitality. John, I'm going to do my best to live that out. Well, I'd like you to imagine being a senior in high school, or at least at that moment in life where you're trying to figure out who you're going to be and what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Because that's just about the point that we meet John, also called Mark. In Acts chapter 12, Luke shares an incredible story of the power of God. Mark is at home with his mom, and a whole bunch of church folks have gathered. They've been praying through the night for the release of Peter. James has already been executed by Herod, and now Peter has been arrested and is sitting in jail. There is a ton of uncertainty, and the prayer is passionate. Somewhere before dawn, there's a knock at the door. Rhoda goes to see who it is, and Peter is knocking. No one believes her at first, but he keeps knocking. As Peter steps in, he has to quiet the crowd. 
They can't believe the power of God or that he has answered their prayers in such a miraculous way. Those present were astonished to say the least. They prayed, God moved, and Peter is free. Can you imagine being there that evening? Can you imagine being with the apostles and experiencing the power and excitement of seeing God move? What would being in those situations and with these people do in the heart of a young man? Or in any of us, for that matter? Like any of us, Mark wanted to be used by God. He wanted to make a difference. He wanted to see God save and change lives. And it wouldn't be long before the doors would open for Mark's big opportunity. Mark's cousin Barnabas and the evangelist to the Gentiles named Paul were going on a grand adventure, a trip around the Mediterranean to bring the gospel to the world. Mark can't turn this down. God has opened all the doors for him. He had to go. It was such a simple answer to join them. Have you ever felt so sure that you're following God's plan, his direction, his calling in your life, only to find out that somehow you've gotten it horribly wrong? We don't know exactly why, but Mark turns back, leaving Paul and Barnabas. And we know that his departure wasn't planned or appreciated because of Paul's reaction the next time Mark wants to be brought along on their trip. Paul and Barnabas, in fact, have such a big argument about bringing Mark along that they part companies and take their own separate trips. Have you ever stepped out for God and failed just like Mark? Have you jumped into ministry and found out that you were in over your head? Or have you walked through the doors that, that God has apparently opened only to find out that you don't even know where you're at? There are two powerful tactics that the devil uses to keep us from being all that God has created us to be. Mark made it over the first hurdle, which is just the fear of taking that first step. That one probably stops more people than the second, but the second is equally successful. The second is discouragement. How easy would it have been for Mark to give up? He had followed God's lead, and it had turned out miserably for him. Why try again? Where was God the first time? Obviously, Mark doesn't know God's will for his life. But thank goodness for the Barnabases that God places in our life. The sons of encouragement. Those who fight for us and give us the courage to try again. Those who believe in us and offer us a second chance. Well, Barnabas includes Mark in his missionary journey. And we really don't know that much about the journey, but we know what happens in the life of Mark after this. 2 Timothy lets us know that Mark grows from this failure, and he becomes a valued traveling companion and scribe to Paul. And later, Mark rejoins the church in Jerusalem. He becomes a right-hand man to Peter. Now, Peter is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, but we know that he's an uneducated, ordinary man. But Mark offers his gifts, his education and his writing ability, to record the teaching and preaching of Peter. In fact, the gospel known as Mark is actually believed to be the, the collection of stories and the preachings, a sermon of Peter that Mark recorded. This is the same Mark whose first ministry attempt ended in failure. What would have happened if Mark had just given up at that point? Mark wouldn't have gone on that missionary journey with Barnabas. He wouldn't have come back and re recorded the first gospel that we know to be written. And we know from church history that Mark grew even from that, that he's believed to have gone on and started the first church in North Africa and to become the Bishop of Alexandria. Maybe fear has prevented you from taking that first step. Or if you have stepped out, maybe just like Mark, it ended in failure. Let me be a Barnabas to you. God has created great things for you and for those who are willing to step out in his name, to brave the harsh world and to overcome failure. We can make a difference for the kingdom of God. You're discovering the more that God has created you for won't always be easy. It won't always be a win, but it will always be worth it. Now let's hear from our Mesa campus pastor, Perry Emmerich. Hey, thank you, Steve. There's a term that's used a lot in missionary context to describe global workers who support their own ministry efforts. 
It's the term tent maker, and it comes from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, which says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So the great apostle Paul, credited for writing over half of the New Testament books, at times supported his own ministry efforts by making tents. And not only that, he partnered up with other tent makers, uh, Aquila and his wife Priscilla, to work and travel together, supporting themselves as they shared the gospel. It's clear that Paul had a very deep connection to these two people. As he brought them along with him, as he, he wrote about them in his letters, he even, in Romans chapter 16, commends them for risking their necks to save his life. And that with that, he acknowledges his own gratitude, but also the gratitude of the churches that he is able to plant because of what they did. So who were these two faithful and loyal business people? Were they simply financial supporters of Paul, or were they more? Well, they were very much more. You see, these two not only traveled and supported Paul, but they were intricately and personally engaged in the ministry of church planning efforts. They were business people, skilled in their trade, but also very much skilled in teaching and training up others in the word. Now, it's interesting to note that when we were first introduced to them, we were first introduced to Aquila, the husband, and then followed by his wife, Priscilla. Now, this had been very customary in that day to lead with the husband's name. But it's interesting to note that their names are used six times in the New Testament, always together. And yet four of those six times, it's Priscilla's name that actually comes first. A very unusual practice. But one that seems to indicate that Priscilla is perhaps the more accomplished teacher, the more effective leader, in, uh, particularly in the work of, the, of ministry that they were doing. And they did a lot of ministry work. You see, after spending about 18 months in Corinth with Paul, they all three traveled to Ephesus, where they planted another church. But soon after, Paul moves on, and Priscilla and Aquila stayed there to help invest and grow this young church, which leads us to a story that I think distinguishes their ministry cred more than anything else. It's an encounter with a young, charismatic preacher named Apollos, who travels to Ephesus and begins teaching accurately about Jesus, but is only aware of the baptism of John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance, not the baptism of Jesus, which was about salvation. And so it says in Acts chapter 18, verse 26, that Priscilla and Aquila invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They took the time to teach this young preacher accurate theology. Well, Apollos goes on to have an amazing ministry impacting countless people for Christ because these two business people were able to teach Apollos accurate theology. He was able to teach others about the true salvation baptism of Jesus. Now, there are some that think that Apollos was one who actually wrote the book of Hebrews, one of the most important books of the New Testament, whose authorship is unknown. But there's others who have proposed that Priscilla may have actually written the book. And her name was withheld to, in order to prevent the dismissal of this master writing simply because she was a woman and not a man. The truth is, is only God knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. But what we know is this. God used these two business people as critical parts of impacting the entire world. And there have been countless business people since who have followed that same path, not considering their work as simply a means to, uh, of their own gain to build their own kingdom, if you will, but rather leveraging their work as a means of investing in the gospel and sharing it and raising up leaders and equipping people to do the ministry they were called to do. And so if you're a business leader, I want to encourage you. No, I want to challenge you. That if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a minister of the gospel. So invest 
in your knowledge of the gospel. Allow God to use you in your credibility as a business person to minister to people I may never have the opportunity to reach or teach. In fact, I personally have benefited from a number of incredible business people who have passionately, uh, who passionately followed Jesus, who have taught and challenged me in my faith. And I'm so grateful for it. You see, God is calling you to do far more than just run a great business. He's calling you to invest in his kingdom with all your life and means. But don't just think that it's those who have lots of resources who can make an impact. Eric Eamon, our Queen Creek campus pastor, is going to share about another person whose only resource was his own story. I love the story that Perry was sharing about Priscilla and Aquila, of how they lived their life as they went through learning about Jesus and then teaching about Jesus and making disciples. They were, in fact, modeling the way Jesus made disciples. Jesus was always calling people to him. In his disciples, you can see people who were spiritual, unspiritual. You could see people who were business people and people who had questions. You could even see that there were people that just weren't like him at all. Jesus was always calling people to him because that's what teachers do. They find disciples and they teach them. And yet there was one that Jesus didn't call to him. There was one disciple he wouldn't let go with him. And we don't know much about this man, but we do know that his life was transformed. We know that he lived in the community of Gerasim. We know that his life was a mess. He was forced to live out in the graveyard because he was banished there by his community. We know he was mentally in turmoil. We know that he was destructive and strong and could break all the chains that they tried to bind him with. We know that he walked around naked and cut himself and he was scaring people. And of course he scared people. He was walking around naked, cutting himself. But we also know something more importantly, that Jesus restored him. And in this dramatic scene, as Jesus his boat comes to the shore. This man comes up and kneels before him and Jesus finds that he is demon possessed. He casts these demons into these pigs that are nearby that run off a cliff. And those hurting the pigs are astonished by what they see. They run into their village. They get everybody they can and they walk out to see what's going on. And when they return, they see something astonishing. This wild man, this powerful man, this naked man was sitting in his right mind clothed talking to Jesus. And all we can gather from this moment is that Jesus spent just one afternoon with this guy. And at the end of the day, Jesus went to get in his boat and this man begged to go with him. And we can see that in this passage, Mark chapter five, verses 18 through 20, it says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis just how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Jesus said, no. Jesus said, you can't go with me. This could have been a huge rejection for this guy. Was it because of his past? Was it because he was demon possessed? Was it because he was a Gentile? Even the disciples might have been questioning why Jesus was sending him away. In fact, Jesus said, go and tell. This too is kind of unique because there's many Jews Jesus healed, but he said, don't tell. But to this Gentile, he said, go and tell. And he told him to tell two things. One, he said, tell what God has done for you. Two, he said, tell that God has mercy, which is a huge thing in this area as a Gentile surrounded by Romans and Roman gods who were not merciful, who were not good, who were not gentle. They were vindictive and selfish but go and tell that he was merciful. And there might've been another statement that Jesus didn't say. You could imagine being in the scenario saying, I've got to be by the man who healed me. This is the only safe place on earth. But Jesus, by not saying anything, was telling him, you are completely healed. You do not need to be in my presence to have the fullness of healing, but go. This scenario, in fact, I believe crushes everything we know about discipleship. 
I believe in education, and yet God doesn't always call the educated. You will never know it all. I believe in having mentors, and yet God often sends us out unprepared. And I believe when you follow God where he wants you to go, you will feel unprepared. So what's your excuse? For as long as I can remember, people have told me, I don't know enough. I don't know enough to tell the story of Jesus. I need another class. And maybe that's you. There are those who feel like their past is so dark, so broken that they can't possibly go. And yet I would tell you that the darker your path, the darker your path or your past, the brighter your restoration. The real question is, has Jesus changed you? That's enough to go on. If you have encountered the living God, you have a story to tell. It's the encounter that we have with Jesus that transforms us. And that is a story worth telling. You may be the forerunner to an area that needs Jesus. This man went to the Decapolis and he was the forerunner to the church as they spread out through Jerusalem. He was a trailblazer. It's not your past failure. It's not your dark past. It's how you respond to God's mercy now. This is not the story of a demon-possessed man. This is a story of a man who was restored by God. What's your story? What's the story you want to tell? And let's keep in mind who this storyteller is. This is John Mark. This is the failed missionary that Steve was just telling us about. He must have felt tremendous encouragement, tremendous encouragement that he can move beyond his past. Now, as we continue, we're going to listen to what Tyler has to challenge us with. So I'm going to wrap this up by reading the words of Apostle Peter. Now he's writing this to the church and I want you right now to lean in and act as if he is writing this directly to you. This is found in 2 Peter 1, 3 through 8. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him and the one who called us to himself by means of marvelous glory and excellence. And because of this glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patience and endurance, and patient and endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Translation, you have all that you need. Now, those are my words. Those are the words of Peter. And Peter would say, don't take it up with me. Take it up with God, right? So if you're denying right now that you have everything that you need, you're denying the power of God. If we think that we're not qualified, that we're not called, that we're not prepared for ministry, we are doubting the promise and the provision of God. So, so look at me, watch this and, and listen very carefully. Jesus didn't die so you could just watch. He died so you could live. So live this life to the fullest. Live a life that glorifies God. Live a life that serves others. Live a life that makes an impact that you were designed to make. Now our campus pastors, they shared all of these real stories from scripture that inspire us. But here's a few of the stories that we could have shared, but we didn't have time, but just to encourage you even more. Ananias had the courage to go where God called him to go. The Ethiopian eunuch was the first to bring the gospel to Northern Africa. Phoebe, and I'm not talking about Phoebe from Friends, she was a deacon in the church and a benefactor of Apostle Paul and many others. The Samaritan woman, many believed in Jesus because of her words. And there were women who financially supported Jesus's ministry. So what's the difference between these people and others? 
Well, these people didn't just watch. They got involved. And there are still many stories that are waiting to be written with you. You're one of those stories. God could be talking to you right here, right now. And let me challenge you with this. You have everything that you need to step into what God has called you to do. So get up, like, like literally, physically get up. This is not a metaphor, okay? Get up from your chair, from your seat, from your couch, wherever you are right here, right now. You're like, that's really awkward, that's weird. Just, just humor me on this one. As a symbol to get up and say, I'm gonna step out. I'm gonna do what God has called me to do. I'm qualified because Jesus loves me. I have all that I need. And church, I know it's easier to stay seated. I know it's more comfortable. I know that there's less risks that you have to take. I know that it's easier, but we were never called for easy. We were made for more. So leave your worries behind. Leave your fear behind. Any reservation that you have, because it's so much more fun to live life this way. I mean, we, we heard Dean in the intro when he was talking about T-ball. I cannot wait to be a part of my son's first T-ball game in a couple years. So let us live this life. Let us be the church. Let us step in and serve and make a difference. That is what we were created to do, and we have everything we need to do so. I'm going to pray for us. God, you're good. Thank you for who you are. God, if we're questioning right now, if we have everything that we need, God, continue to let us know that we do because we have you and we lack nothing if we have you, Jesus. You're so good. You're worthy of all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor goes to you. And everyone, even if you're watching a TV screen or a computer screen right now, said amen.